My name is Anna Weiss, and I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Emergency Medicine here at CHOP. I'm thrilled to be talking with you all today on a topic that is so important to all of us in our roles as both teachers and as lifelong learners. I hope to explore a bit of the history of teaching in medicine and to address some of the big questions that have begun to surface as we face a new era of medical education informed by the power of informatics. Teaching and learning in Western medicine used to be easy. The formal study of medicine as a professional field in Western culture was established in ancient Greece with the foundation of the Hippocratic School. Health was the achievement of balance among the four primary humors pictured here, and there really wasn't a lot in the way of therapeutic intervention at a practitioner's disposal. Knowledge in the field of medicine was acquired by apprenticing oneself to a medical practitioner, watching as he concocted and administered balms from the plants in his medicinal garden, and perhaps by memorizing four flashcards of the humors themselves. The humoral theory of medicine was further refined by the Roman Galen, and it prevailed throughout Europe for nearly two millennia, in part because the theory did not conflict with the teachings of Judeo-Christian tradition, which governed most of Western geopolitics at the time. So you can see that as a medical teacher or trainee in medieval France, for example, there really wasn't a tremendous amount of knowledge to master, and there were no set standards for medical practitioners, so no DIOs or program directors worried about accreditation. In the Renaissance, an explosion of artistic, literary, and scientific exploration advanced the field of medicine considerably. Artists like da Vinci, whose work is pictured here, used the artistic value of anatomy to circumvent the church's prohibition on human dissection and began to illustrate what they discovered about the workings of the human body. The science of human anatomy and the practice of midwifery were established as formal fields of study in this period, with respective bodies of knowledge that were considered standard for competent practice. Nevertheless, medical knowledge was still relatively finite and was acquired in a fashion that was both unregulated and haphazard. The 19th century finally saw a firm departure from the humoral theory of medicine and an increase in the number of formalized, university-based medical training programs. New knowledge in the field grew to include germ theory and the need for sterilization, a broadened understanding of therapeutics, including ether and nitrous oxide for anesthesia, quinine for malaria, and the first use of salicylates, and new technologies such as the radiograph and the stethoscope, which allowed practitioners to look under the hood of live patients. The American Civil War and other 19th century European conflicts dramatically increased the body of knowledge in surgical practice, and by the end of the 19th century, it was standard practice for medical students and other trainees to learn anatomy and surgical therapeutics by watching procedures live in the operating room. Medical knowledge at this time was consolidated into written textbooks, such as the famed Gray's Anatomy, and knowledge acquisition was tested by way of written examinations and demonstration of procedural skill. By the end of the 20th century, medical education looked pretty much like what all of us in this session are used to. Accredited programs delivered standardized curricula with content delivered in textbooks, slides, chalk talks, and curated primary literature. Procedural and physical exam skills were taught for the most part on live patients, with the occasional aid of simulation mannequins and standardized patients. As we began to understand that trainees needed time to consolidate their newly acquired knowledge, we put them in teams for problem-based learning sessions. We asked trainees to apply their knowledge in supervised settings, practicing on real patients and in simulation scenarios with gradually increasing degrees of autonomy. Finally, we ensured shared understanding of baseline knowledge with proctored testing. USMLE exams, in-training exams, boards, and structured clinical examinations. However, since the dawn of the 21st century, we have been faced with a serious problem when it comes to our tried and true methods of passing on medical knowledge. There is simply too much. In 1950, given the rate of biomedical discovery, knowledge in the field of medicine doubled every 50 years. By 2010, when I graduated from medical school, the entirety of the world's medical knowledge was doubling approximately every three and a half years. Last year, the sheer volume of discovery drove that doubling time to 0.2 years or 73 days. At that rate, 
it would take a medical student or resident approximately 21 to 22 hours per day of reading nothing but primary literature to stay current. Clearly, that is not a sustainable plan. And what we consider to be critical knowledge for a medical trainee is no longer simply the tenets of pathophysiology or the psychomotor steps of a procedural task. That is, even if one were to stay current on the literature and practice LPs and lac repairs the other three hours of the day, that too would be insufficient. We have, for the most part, a shared understanding of what we want our trainees to know when it comes to the biological basis of disease, but we want 21st century learners to go further. We care and we want them to care not only about what they know, but about how they think and how they interact with, care for, and lead others. We want them to take time for self-reflection and to engage in deliberative practice and mastery learning. We want them to slow down and seek help in the areas where they have trouble and to seek autonomy in the areas where they excel. We want them to engage with their own metacognition and to spend time examining their own cognitive and interpersonal biases. So how are we and how are they supposed to keep track of it all? How do educators embedded in a highly nuanced system of interprofessional teams where the content to be known is seemingly infinite, shepherd our trainees to a place where we can tell them and tell society that they are ready to be trusted as independent practitioners. This is where informatics and human factors engineering can play such a powerful role. As we move toward a future in which a nuanced understanding of the ecosystem of medicine is as important as, really, if not more important than knowledge of which antibiotics currently cover MRSA, machine learning and human factors engineering hold extraordinary promise. Moving forward, I am excited about a future where learned content is curated to the trainee and is specific to their personal needs at a given moment in their development where we harness informatics to teach clinical reasoning and informed knowledge seeking rather than memorization of facts, and where we ensure that our coaching of reflective practice is embedded in teams and within systems rather than directed to the siloed individual. It is a bright future indeed if we can achieve it, and I'm excited that we have such incredible colleagues in informatics to help us advance this vision. Thank you so much for listening, and I am excited to discuss this with you all further. Thank you all for inviting me to be a participant in this panel. I have to admit, when my kids found out I was giving this talk, they found it quite funny, as I am definitely a digital immigrant and often get very frustrated by technology. Uh, however, I am actually really excited about the collaboration. Next group. I really look forward to seeing what happens as we uh, and the projects that we can continue to collaborate on as we move forward. So I did take the liberty of reframing the question that Naveen initially uh, gave to me. And I really want to think about how we use information systems to help us better understand what our learners are doing and what they need. A secondary question that comes up, and which actually Dan mentioned in his talk last week, was can we and should we use informatics to measure competency? That is actually not a question I'm going to address in today's discussion, um, but I'm hoping that in our assessment session that we'll be able to delve into that a little bit and have some good discussion uh, surrounding that particular topic. So, what is medical education? We often say that we educate medical students, but that we train residents and fellows. To me, we are really educating physicians to be excellent providers as they go through the uh, course of their career, but we're doing it in the system that exists now. Ideally, the system does not say the same, and I think it's important to um, think about how information systems can be incorporated into the improvement of education and training as we move forward. 
Let me use the specific example of clinical reasoning uh, in discussing the way we can use information systems. So what is clinical reasoning? To me, it's very much a process um, where we are gathering data, we are sifting through it. I'm sorry, I'm using my hands, which you guys can't see. Um, but we are sifting through it. We're, we're developing the idea of what labs and images are differential and sort of narrowing in on diagnosis and developing a management plan. Ideally, there's a piece of self-reflection in there as well. And as teachers, we can observe this in our learners through the development of their illness scripts, through whether they recognize when a patient fits a clinical pathway or when they don't. Um, or even when they accurately change the management plan of a really complex patient based on new symptoms or lab results, et cetera. And I think um, information systems can really help us both in developing clinical reasoning, but also in trying to track the clinical reasoning of our learners. And uh, this leads me to some questions that were brought to me actually five or six years ago now when a very astute resident named Evan Orenstein came with this idea for a project in his medical education advanced skills um, uh, certificate program. And he wanted to develop a simulation that um, taught interns in particular how to better use the EHR in gathering information about um, their patients and recognizing concerning information um, or acknowledging when they didn't recognize concerning information. And so I think, um, you know, both he and then Irene who took it over when Evan left was, um, you know, focused on can we teach clinical reasoning through information systems? And then how do we measure clinical reasoning through information systems? And I'm hoping both he and uh, Irene, either today or in other sessions, will be able to talk a bit more about this project, as I think it has um, led Edmund down um, a path that is really uh, enhancing his career and uh, the education of many learners. I think it led me to think a bit more about the use of artificial intelligence and technology in both teaching clinical, clinical reasoning, but also in medical education in general. You know, is this something that we should use to replace our own clinical reasoning? Is it something we really should just use as a way to augment clinical reasoning? Um, for me personally, that's what it seems like, but uh, I know many people have different ideas. And um, another area that I think is actually can be really helpful uh, is in struggling learners. So everyone has a different learning style, throw in some meta terms, um, but you know, there are areas um, or reasons to use technology to improve or to help learners identify areas that they need to improve, or to help them develop skills that are necessary for them to be excellent providers moving forward. So I think there, there is a, a big role, and this is definitely an area that I would love to discuss more with, with each of you in the Q&A session. But I really think sort of my ideas around how to incorporate technology and artificial intelligence have led me to is this sort of existential type of question of should we just blow up medical education as it currently exists and think about teaching medical students the softer skills of compassion and good communication, but really teaching them how to use technology effectively. Does the artificial intelligence of the radiologist, um, or actually is the artificial intelligence better than the radiologist in terms of uh, picking up abnormalities on scans and such? And how do we incorporate that into the education world, both as we know it and as we think about what the future is going to look like? Again, as I, I think I mentioned already, is you know, medical education and medicine in general does not embrace change very quickly. And how can we incorporate this, both maybe in baby steps, but also in much larger steps, if it's the right thing to do, um, but maybe it's not. 
So um, what comes up for me in particular is the role of human factors engineering, um, both in medical education and training. And Dan actually mentioned this in his talk as well last week, and he actually broke it down into a way of thinking about medical education is focused on an individual, that QI focuses on teams, and clinical informatics focuses on the system. To me, human factors engineering both focuses on the teams and the systems, but with a lens towards patient safety. And should we actually be incorporating more human factors engineering education uh, into medical school and into our residency and fellowship training? Should we maybe have a human factors engineer on every clinical team that rounds in the hospital or in the clinics? I don't have the answers to that. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, is going to give you a lot more questions than answers, but I definitely think it's something to think about. Questions that have come up for me and that I think are something worth folks thinking about as this series progresses is, you know, what is the role of information systems as an educational tool? There is some research out there in the literature, um, but has anyone really looked at whether information systems improves cost savings? What about learner effectiveness? We know that learners like simulation and like um, hands-on things like focus, et cetera, but does it really make a difference in their learning? And does it change their behaviors? And sort of the gold star of most research is does it actually improve patient outcome? And that's been a really difficult um, outcome to measure in education projects as so many different things factor into whether something changes patient outcomes. And it can be really hard to um, narrow it down to just one uh, tool or to one change. But I think that that is something that our uh, informatics friends in particular can help us think about is how do we do better research projects around both um, technology that we may use in education, but also in terms of thinking about the many different pieces of information that our, our learners gather over time. Finally, I just want to leave you with this thought as an educator that I don't actually think information systems should replace teachers. Um, information systems should really be used to augment learning by identifying the learner's needs. Um, again, is it a struggling learner or someone who's doing really well um, but could continue to be challenged and pushed? Um, but I also think technology and information systems should provide unique uh, and enhanced learning activities. Again, uh, and I do think that there's a role there for struggling learners as well that we could probably continue uh, expand upon. Again, I thank you guys for inviting me. I hope that this has been, um, again, just a, an introduction to some of the questions that go through both my mind and through um, I, that I've had with uh, some informatics friends in various conversations over the years. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm probably going to take a lot of those questions and turn it back around to the panel uh, as we hit to the, the discussion portion here. Um, and so last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Evan Orenstein. Thanks very much. Uh, I am Evan Ornstein. I'm a pediatric hospitalist and clinical informaticist at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and Emory University. I'm really excited to be uh, back at CHOP, having completed my training there, uh, presenting to you guys about the role of clinical decision support in medical education. Is it just in time training or is it promoting cookbook medicine? I do have a couple of disclosures. I'm a, a co-founder and have equity in Phrase Health, a clinical decision support analytics company. Uh, received no direct revenue, but uh, I am principal investigator on a grant with them. Clinical decision support, which many uh, of you are familiar with, is about 
uh, changing processes and using things like the electronic health record to be, uh, help clinicians and patients make better decisions. The basic framework uh, that's most commonly used, which comes from Jerry Oshroff, is the five rights of clinical decision support. So the idea is that we want to try to provide the right information to the right person in the right intervention format, through the right channel, and at the right time in the workflow. And the primary goal of clinical decision support is really about helping people make uh, good medical choices that are going to lead to better outcomes, not necessarily education, but as we'll talk about, I think it contributes a lot to education. So just to give an example of what I would call sort of good and bad uh, clinical decision support, uh, these are two examples using a very similar channel to provide uh, very specific decision support to different folks. Uh, but because the format is a little different, uh, it leads to that decision support being provided at different times in the workflow uh, with uh, variable consequences. Uh, and I do want to credit uh, Eric Shelloff for, for this uh, slide idea. So within electronic health records, we have lots of different formats of clinical decision support. We've got order sets, alerts, uh, navigators, list columns, et cetera. All these different ways to adjust the information system to try to guide people towards evidence-based practices and improve clinical outcomes. But the next question for me is, what does this do in terms of medical education? So I want to use the uh, Wiccan's model for human information processing, which is a, a, an information processing framework in the human factors literature. And the basic idea is that uh, there are different stimuli that go through your senses and cause you to perceive information uh, about a situation that you might need to act on. When you perceive that information, you uh, also uh, place a certain amount of attention on it and you also interpret it based on your long-term memory. And that's sort of the, the knowledge piece is because you have that long-term memory, memory, it affects what you perceive. That's why you know an attending physical exam may be faster, but maybe uh, actually more to the point and more useful than somebody who's, who's earlier in their training. That information then leads you to a decision and response selection. And in that situation, you're working using your working memory to weigh the different options, to come up with the different options you might select. And then you execute uh, that decision. And then based on what happens, uh, kind of go through that cycle again. Clinical decision support tends to focus on this first kind of primary pathway from perception to a decision uh, and to a response that's going to give you feedback. But what I think would be really is really interesting is to think about how does clinical decision support also interact with both your working memory uh, and your long-term memory. In the literature, this has been studied in, in some places, in, in particular in an adult um, uh, pulmonology rotation. Uh, there was a group that essentially tried to look at uh, uh, adult residents' knowledge of cystic fibrosis and COPD management. And so they administered a test before the rotation occurred. Uh, residents went, then went through their pulmonary rotation and at the end of the rotation uh, took another test. Uh, in the middle of this, they implemented new cystic fibrosis and COPD order sets that recommended specific evidence-based care. And what they did is they compared the residents who went through the rotation before uh, the order set was implemented to those after the order set was implemented. And what you can see in table two uh, is the column of residents who uh, were surveyed before and after. Their numbers were not uh, particularly large, so only 11 uh, residents before, 28 after. You did see a fairly substantial difference in the overall test score uh, that was higher among the order set group. And unadjusted, that was significant, but when adjusted for their baseline knowledge, uh, was no longer significant. And that was sort of a similar trend, not just in their overall test scores, uh, but in their knowledge, uh, in their order writing skill, et cetera. So I think this is useful because it does at least suggest that uh, order sets aren't making people worse. People aren't so much relying on the order set that they don't gain any new knowledge. Uh, they're at least looking like they gain as much knowledge as those who didn't have the order set may be higher, although not necessarily statistically significantly. So with that in mind, I want to think about a couple of cases of clinical decision support uh, and how they affect education. So uh, case one, we'll talk about blood product special processing errors. Uh, so this is uh, from the Serious Hazards of Transfusion Report, which is in the, the UK, uh, that collects uh, errors in blood products uh, um, from across the UK. 
And what they found essentially is that there's a large amount of errors because of human factors issues and because of the information technology uh, in their systems. Uh, and here at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, we had some situations where uh, ordering errors uh, occurred, um, leading to kind of an institutional focus on this problem. To improve on this, we used a technique called formative usability testing. And the basic idea is we came up with an initial candidate design of what we thought this should look like. We then brought it to frontline users uh, in a test environment. And instead of just asking, do you like it or not, we gave them a patient care scenario and then watched what they did. Based on whether what they did was sort of correct for what we were looking for or not, we would talk about what cues might have led them to the more evidence-based decision. And we adjusted the design and then we sort of did that iteratively. We ended up going through about 27 users, uh, 17 scenarios, and leading to 18 design changes, 12 of which were, were considered major. And some of these, I think, could have very much an educational uh, impact. So this was uh, the prepare red blood cell order uh, before the intervention, and here is what it looked like uh, after the intervention. There are lots of different changes in here, but what I want to draw attention to was how we asked about special processing requests. So in the original design, we asked people if they wanted the blood irradiated, washed, CMV negative, or phenotypically similar. Uh, I personally did not know what any of those things really meant before I, I did this project, and we found a number of our users uh, kind of a, in a similar situation. But what uh, many did know is uh, if patients had specific conditions. So instead of asking, do you want your blood irradiated, we asked, do they have any indication for irradiation and gave people options and selecting those would cascade uh, to uh, an irradiated selection on that blood product and similar for these other special processing approaches. We then evaluated this using a summative usability test where we directly compared our newly designed order set to the original design so we weren't changing it in the middle. Uh, we had people to try to assess the, the educational impact, we had them actually take a quiz on special processing requests before going through this and then again afterwards uh, to see what kind of change there might be um, for uh, those who used our redesigned order set compared to those who didn't. And these were our results overall. Uh, we did see a significant uh, improvement in task completion with no errors, people uh, ordering everything exactly correctly. The number of severe errors in simulation went down significantly, although you do still see uh, many present. Uh, no significant change in time. And we did see a bump in the quiz grade in the group that was randomized to use the, redes use the redesigned order set, uh, but the p-value is 0.15, so with our sample uh, was maybe not quite significant. Case two, I want to talk about uh, ketogenic diet uh, medication errors. I want to give some credit to uh, Dr. Ben Siegel, who is our um, uh, resident running this project. So first, what are we trying to accomplish for those who, who um, uh, need a refresher on this, uh, such as myself? Uh, the ketogenic diet is a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet leading to ketosis. The brain uses ketones instead of glucose for fuel. And then some magic happens that I'm sure some of the neurologists uh, could explain better than I can, but essentially seizure frequency goes down. The risk is that many of our uh, medications have lots of sugar in them. That's how we get toddlers to take them. And they can sometimes have enough sugar that they can actually kick somebody out of ketosis and increase their risk of seizures. At baseline, we had alert, an alert when you opened the chart. Uh, and had lots and lots of information in it, and buried in there uh, was the fact that medications have to be in their lowest carbohydrate form. But when we look back at our data, we found over 3,800 administrations of carbohydrate-containing medications uh, to patients on a ketogenic diet, uh, despite that piece of decision support. So we developed a new alert, uh, and the idea was to focus a little bit better on the right timing so that this would only fire if somebody was ordering a carbohydrate-containing medication uh, in patients on ketogenic diet. We went through that same formative usability testing uh, process, and I like to highlight this just to show that you really don't have to have a perfect um, uh, candidate solution to do formative usability testing. You can kind of see this was developed in PowerPoint, showing people different approaches of what this might look like, walking them through a scenario, and then asking them what they would do. And we learned from that and ended up developing an alert that looked like this. So if you were tried to order a carbohydrate-containing medication, uh, this would fire and by default would have you remove the offending medication. And if you decided you wanted to keep it, required uh, an acknowledged reason. So adding some friction to what we thought was doing the wrong thing. We then did a summative usability test. And we, had, uh, we randomized people to uh, kind of a crossover design. So in the top row, 
Uh, the first scenario, people saw the chart open alert only. They didn't see the new alert that we had designed. And of the 10 people we showed this to, four of them attempted a carbohydrate containing order and all four of them signed it. In their second scenario, they saw the original chart open alert as well as the new alert at order entry. Those same four participants attempted a carbohydrate containing order, but none of them signed it, suggesting that that alert was effective for those people. In the bottom row, we started another 10 people with the intervention group. And in that case, five people attempted to place the carbohydrate containing order, but none of them signed it. What was interesting is in their second scenario, we took away that decision support and none of those five people who'd previously attempted a carbohydrate containing order attempted a new one. And so that suggests that there really is uh, potentially some learning effect, uh, at least in the short term, uh, that people got out of that clinical decision support. And in terms of outcomes, we saw a 58% acceptance rate, which in alert world is, is very good. Uh, and when we look at our outcomes, the total number of carbohydrate containing orders per uh, inpatient day for ketogenic diet patients, we saw a 53% reduction. Uh, and in our hospital system, we implemented this uh, at each campus at different times. And the timing of error reduction was associated with the timing of alert implementation. So in conclusion, uh, thinking again about this Wiccan's uh, framework for understanding human information processing, clinical decision support we're pretty sure can affect this central pipeline. So poorly designed decision support may not, but we're, we're fairly confident that well-designed decision support can improve this. Uh, for working memory, I think there's more evidence than not that clinical decision support can affect uh, how people behave, not just in the current situation, but in subsequent situations based on the decision support they've seen. Uh, and as for its effect on long-term memory, I think we have a hypothesis that this may really be helping people's long-term memory and developing their, their medical education, uh, but still working on developing evidence for that. And that's it. I'll be happy to take questions. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Evan. I'm not sure if you saw, there's one question in the chat about the feedback link, I think, in your alert um, and what you do with that. Yeah, so the, the feedback link uh, goes to the, that phrase health application, so clinical decision support analytics program that is active at CHOP as well. Uh, and so any owners of that alert uh, will get basically an email notification that somebody's given some feedback uh, and is a useful way to see that, uh, you know, something's broken, uh, for example. And this is Daria. I just want to say for the record, because Jonathan Buse is giving me a hard time about it in the chat personally. Like, I actually didn't know that. Um, I, I, in, in the same way that Evan has, like, you know, connections to Freeze Health, as do I, I was more asking because I have seen, like, Adam Wright and others, like, present on this, and we know that that's, like, an effective way to get feedback. So I just, disclaimer there, I actually didn't know that and learned something new here. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a prompt. <laughs> awesome. Well, we will keep an eye on the chat for more questions, but I kind of wanted to start um, the group by, you know, it was interesting. I think all three of you sort of questioned the premise of the of the session or the way that the uh, the question was worded for the session in, in very different ways. And so I'm curious, you know, as you sort of reflect back on each other's presentations, um, are there sort of um, ideas that you sort of think about, you know, as we think about that, you know, more transdisciplinary future that both Anna and Dan Schumacher in his talk last week were sort of describing, uh, and Rebecca a little bit in, in her presentation as well. I mean, I think I'll just start by saying, I think, you know, the, the common underlying thread is that the system as currently written is not necessarily working the way that we hope it will, particularly given the rate of biomedical discovery, right? Um, and so as we think about um, alterations in what we want people to know, um, really looking to our colleagues to say like, um, what are you, how did you learn that? How did you know, like, I think the thing that has been so fun in talking to Evan and Naveen and Mark um, and Tony and Irit, and whenever they come to education meetings or we go to informatics discussions, right, is to say, you know, how, here, here's how I think I know that somebody knows something. 
right? But you have this whole other way of, of actually kind of, in my mind, proving that they either saw something because it was in the medical record or they did something because it was in the medical record, either a procedure or the, an order set that was executed correctly, right? That's a whole new world for medical educators, right? Because as Rebecca pointed out, we spend a lot of time thinking about, well, we think we know how to teach you facts, but we that that final brass ring of proving that we're making patients' lives better has been much harder to achieve. And so I think it's been very, very exciting for us to think about um, this, this really at the sharp end and then even further at the patient end, seeing results in a way that is very exciting and new. Yes, yeah, this is Evan. I'll, I'll just add, I think for me, what, what's very interesting is to try to understand what is the information system good at teaching us or educating us about and what isn't it? And therefore, sort of what is the role of, of the human? And uh, something Rebecca said earlier that I think, uh, you know, resonates a lot with me is, you know, when I have my residents now, I try to spend a lot of time teaching them how to elicit a good history, how to communicate well, and how to select from treatment options, right? The things that a computer is going to be furthest from. And in that, I think, you know, of the different types of reasoning, particularly diagnostic reasoning is one of the harder ones to get across with the electronic health record. Um, and I you know Jonathan Buse is doing a lot of cool work in that area. So hopefully that'll not be true in, in a little while. But um, the way we elicit information is affected by, by our medical knowledge. And the computer doesn't know any information unless it's been elicited and entered into it. Right. So to me, it's sort of a that's where we need to focus our education the kind of effector piece, what do you do once you've established a diagnosis? That's the kind of thing the electronic health record should be pretty good at suggesting to us. Um, and so to me, the hope would be to say, we're going to build and build up the medical record to make, you know, not have you memorize, you know, what your local susceptibility patterns to MRSA are, but have you uh, have a really good diagnostic acumen so that when somebody comes with chief complaint X, you know, you're eliciting the right questions. Um, and then finally, I think, what, what, as Anna was saying, you know, can we use the data that come back to uh, assess the people's competence in a way that we haven't necessarily been able to do before? And I would just add, it, it speaks to the fact that we still are operating in silos in many way. And like this colloquium, I think you called it, is like a perfect example of why we need to have more of this. Um, because we each kind of think in our own way and having these discussions and sharing ideas is a great way to partnership and, and expand on these ideas and projects. Great, and, and Evan, I love. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I love that Evan brings up sort of thinking about like what are computers really good at, and what are what are humans really good at? Because that's where that's the intersection of the the knowledge doubling time problem right like it, it if you could memorize it all then we wouldn't have this some some of this sort of knowledge crisis but really what we need people to know in terms of facts is we need them to know how to look it up and how to harness technology to help them so what can't the computers do right the, the computers can't do the piece that we talked about before which is really self-reflect right and think about the interface between themselves and their team and their team and their system or themselves and their patients, right? That's something that you're, that our, our clinical decision support is never going to really do for us, right? And so really teaching people the, um, the human part of medicine and, and like the, the metacognitive part of it, as opposed to the, the pieces that you can, that you can look up or that you can get a machine to help you know. We have a question from Don Boyer. Don, do you want to you want to share? Yeah, I think we're we're really getting to that um, through this discussion, and then through the other comments that you know came right around the same time around the the thinking fast, thinking slow. Like, how do we move to that next level? I think a lot of the clinical decision support is really great at helping us know what to do um, and when to do it. But I think you know thinking about how do we leverage this to help understand more of the whys? You know, why why do we not want those, car, you know, high carbohydrate medications for the ketogenic diet patient? Um, why are we trying to, why do we need to irradiate blood for certain patients, like this specific patient population? And I think that's where, again, some of the um, points already raised are, are helping me think through, through that piece of the machine versus the, the human piece.
any thoughts on the on the you know how do we sort of think about the whys uh, in the work um, from anybody on the panel? I'll add, I guess, you know, one interesting piece to me is sort of this the the separation of recognition from recall. Um, you know, there there is sort of a first time you learn a concept, and then if you're like me, you forget that concept a lot of times, right? But um, you know, in the I think it's hard to necessarily with the information system get the why the first time through, but a lot of this is stuff that people may have seen kind of in one place, but where I think it's really helpful, you know, so I'm not an education expert, but my understanding from the education literature, right, is we know testing kind of repetitions cause people to learn really effectively. And I think the electronic health record is almost that source of repetition. And you have to, you know, take a test, right? You have to select your antibiotic for, you know, this patient with osteomyelitis, and then you have to do it again. And every time you do that, right, the thing is saying, you know, if they, you know, it, under these conditions, choose this antibiotic, under those conditions, choose that antibiotic, and you have to make a choice. Um, and so I, I do think the, I think there's a lot of potential, particularly to reinforce a why through that design uh, over time. Great, there's another question from Ellen Deutsch in the chat. Uh, she said, great work, and it's uh, great that you're using simulation in your usability testing. This is sort of related to that idea just uh, that you just shared, I think, Evan, which is, you know, do you think that alerts will sort of become responsive to individual providers? So can we sort of think about decision support that's adjusted for novices and experts um, uh, and based on, you know, their other behavior, like their recent searches or something, actually be able to have something that's more responsive? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good question. So we thought about, you know, not just for alerts, but for, uh, you know, the way handoffs display, et cetera. Um, we started kind of trying to look into this. I can tell you there's a couple technical limitations, at least for, for organizations using Epic. There's not, um, you can have an order appear a certain way for a resident or a physician, but not necessarily very much based on the provider's history, the person, the user, as opposed to the patient. So uh, we've raised that to, to Epic because one thought we sort of had is, you know, forget the important medical education stuff. What about just all the communication that we have to do operationally? Could we just make a one-time alert at the one workflow where we want to tell you to do something different and then shut up? Um, and right now the answer is no, we, we cannot shut up. Um, so there's some technical limitations to that, but um, I think there's fairly good evidence that the needs uh, are different. Uh, and so, you know, the I think there, there's a lot of interest in trying to pursue that, but um, I don't know how to do it just yet. Yeah, thoughts from from many of our educator colleagues uh, uh, on the panel around, you know, what would an ideal version of that sort of novice, uh, you know, we, we you know we we sort of focus on the technical limitations, but let's say we were sort of doing some aspirational work, what would that look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the question, so relying on experts like Evan and Ivy and Jonathan and all of these folks here to say, you know, can we teach the intelligence or the clinical decision support piece in an intelligent way to grow with our progress? Um, and, you know, can you change that as we do learn things and how do you reinforce it occasionally but continue that learning um, within the system, I think is an interesting piece that I certainly do not have the knowledge of the inner workings to understand. And it sounds like Evan and others are continuing to work on that. Um, but I think that's where, again, we as teachers have a role in, we can see some of that, right, as our learners progress, but we are still learning ourselves. And so how do we reinforce that or continue to teach ourselves those things too? Hi, this is really cool. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, I, sorry. This is Daria. I, I, I yes. love a really cool comment. So <laughs> you can go ahead and tell us what is really uh, no, cool. No, I was about to get really, like, kind of take a step back and um, get boring. So tell us the really cool thing. <laughs> well, now, now the bar is very high. I was just going to say, you know, I think in terms, I, I love, Ellen, your, your point about the personalization piece. And I mean, I think in, in some ways, that's where I would love it what my last slide right but i really 
I think that's where we should be going with this, right? That we should be curating content um, and having it be specific to our learners and, and specific to our EHR users, right? So if I were designing an alert, um, you might have a multi-stage alert that if you habitually do it wrong, you still have to see all of the, the multi-stages of the alerts. If you, and if beyond that, you still do it wrong, maybe there's a link that to an article <laughs> or whatever it is, like some link to some, to the why, right? Like, it seems to me that, right, like, huh, you, it looks like these steps are difficult for you. Let's go back to the why about why we're doing this so we can, re we can give you some underlying knowledge, right? If you're really good at that, maybe you get to, you get to bypass some of those and you sort of get the, the like level one um, gateway alert and then you actually get to keep going because the EHR knows that like, I'm really good at ordering cefepim for children with pseudomonas and really, really not good at ordering blood, for example, right? And so they're like, oh, it's Weiss. We got to make sure that we <laughs> give her the, all the possible alerts for blood. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That, that will, I love that that was this, Daria. This is, that was great that that's where your really cool um, part went because I think actually my boring part was actually like a question about kind of like this like technical to getting to the really cool is just thinking about like as we are um, you know, thinking about our current capabilities and our ability to see, better understand what users are doing um, as a result of the alerts that they're seeing. And I love that we're, you know, thinking more about the design. I just wonder about like opportunities for things that are like maybe in between, like audit and feedback, right? I think like as the educators, like the thing that gets, that I heard Rebecca say that is good is that like educators can see progression over time, but do we, it, with our current like technical systems, have the ability to provide educators with maybe like a, a little bit more granular and data driven, um, like, uh, yeah, data driven way of going back to their uh, trainees to say like, I see you doing this. And also the data is showing me, like I'm like thinking about Evan like that, chart that you showed it's like ordered and then signed and then like you know over time to say like you know we don't have the multi-stage alert that anna is talking about yet but like ooh, like daria you are really like each time you like blew through those alerts and you're like doing the blood stuff like maybe we need you to focus on that 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 might be kind of like an intermediary step and also um like from the education literature just thinking about what are the components of audit and feedback that may be um, really salient to um, the education process. Like how often do you need to give it to trainees? What do they need to know? And then does that actually like modify their behavior changes? So just interested to hear. And maybe that's a future, maybe, maybe this is a future session. I don't know. <laughs> I guess the question is like, one, do we think that we have like the te technical capability like in the current state or with little work to be able to provide that to educators? And two, as educators, would that level of information be valuable to be able to provide to trainees to guide alterations? I'll just say the the first piece. I think um, I believe there's going to be some later presentations in the in the colloquium from from Mark Mai, for example, um, trying to address the you know what kinds of data can we return to educators on uh, re trainees' experiences and you know maybe their performance, right? Which is where we would want to get to. So I, th I think there's there's some ability to do that, but one of these things I think you're kind of forming. You know what are we capable of? What do we actually want? at the same time and has to sort of do that dance um, back and forth a few times. All right, we're at the top of the hour. So there's a link in the chat for the um, um, CME uh, feedback form. So if people could please fill those out to get credit and then Maybe the last thing, if we ha have any of the panelists that want to make one more comment, I'd be curious again, in terms of steps moving forward, um, in addition to the questions and comments that are in the chat, are there ideas that the panelists have around what are activities that would really advance you know, the future that, that you all have been describing? 
I mean, I'll say I, I think this is something that you'll be talking about in your second and third sessions. But, you know, as I think about um, I have a particular interest in learner assessment, right, um, and in competence. So as I think about how we um, how we present a, a, a fully formed residency graduate to society and say, behold, we have a trustworthy physician. Um, I would love to know from the EHR, for example, that under the hood, I can actually prove what they've seen in terms of caseload, right? What they've done in terms of procedures, um, not simply sort of what their in-service scores are and that they pass the boards. And e is pointing out, that's session four. Future plug, love it. Yeah, and for, for me, I, I really want a, uh, an ability to intervene and sort of assess before and after um, on some of those competencies. So whether that's uh, things like, you know, situ awareness, situational awareness, global assessment uh, technique that, that you and that Naveen and, and Areed have been pioneering, uh, whether that is, um, you know, other outcomes in terms of just knowledge assessment, things like that. Uh, I'm very interested sort of in the, how do, we, how do we tell if a particular intervention that was aimed to produce knowledge X uh, is producing knowledge X uh, that we can build on a micro level as a model that, that can then be built up. And, and I think how does all of this apply to the struggling learner in particular? Because we know that we are notoriously bad at sharing that information with program directors, clerkship directors, et cetera. Um, and often we may write it in evals, but it's too late or things like that. And so can we identify them early on to prevent some of those struggles um, and hopefully improve patient outcomes over time. But I think that's gonna leap, link back to some of the competency stuff as well. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that is certainly something that you know is a great reminder for us to always keep in the back of our minds. Uh, I don't know that we on the informatics side think about that as much. We sort of, uh, this came up during the discussion with Dan, right? That we sort of think about like, well, how do we just sort of engineer the human variation out of the system if we're really trying to target safety? Um, but to think about, you know, again, the struggling learner as a, as a person that is struggling and needs some help, I think is very important. Um, well, I wanna thank everybody as we wrap up here for all the great discussion uh, in comments and questions in the chat, um, for the panel for sharing their expertise and all their work. And uh, again, as a reminder, the next session will be April 8th. So we will look forward to seeing uh, you all there and picking up this conversation then. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. It's great to see you all again. You too, Evan. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Bye.